I'm so thrilled. This is, uh, at one point I wondered, from the way things were unfolding, would we have two or three people, or even that? And, um, and today's been a great day. I've gotten uh, to walk all the way down to the Ontario Gallery of Art. From Woodbine and Danforth. So it's been uh, a wonderful day. And I stopped at River something Park, Riverdale. Riverdale. Uh, past some uh, homeless shelters in the woods, <laughs> so right. getting yeah. down from the bridges to the uh, Don River Parkway. I think it's called. Yeah. Or city you all have said. I'm just thrilled to be here and, and making acquaintances with all of you. I will try to give a little bit of a picture of last night, but before I do, I want to remind us of what it says on the archway as one enters the Mystery Center at Delphi. And it says, O human, know thou thyself. Last evening, one of the major themes, in case it didn't come to you in your recapitulation last night, is that when we look at a computer and the software in the computer, and I can expand this to robots and artificial intelligence, you will find that although we are the creators in it, of it, there is something that the computer is not. If I, maybe some of you know set theory, but if I were to have a, 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 a poster paper and I put all sorts of dots on this paper, and then I drew a circle around some group of the dots, and I said, that's group A, or that's set A then what is not set A is everything else. Right? So the not operation is fundamentally important in all computers. All software uses it. All software uses the logic operations called and, or, or not, or combinations of those. A computer does not know how to do arithmetic, cannot do multiplication or addition. It fakes it. It is a new form of Maya. It does this by having truth tables, what they're called, and the AND operation needs both sources to be true for the outcome to be true. The OR needs only one of the sources to be true. And then you can put not with it. And most memory is made from what's called NAND gates, which means not AND, or NOR gates, which means not OR. Now, don't worry. You don't have to know all of this to get the rest of this. But I'm bringing it up because when we look at computers, it's helpful to know that it's built on the NOT. And the not helps us to see what is the human. Do you see what I'm saying? What is the human goes beyond what the computer is. So whatever you can say that computer can do, there's something about that computer that is not human. N-O-T. N-O-T, not with a K. N-O-T. <laughs> And as you can see that not human, it helps you to realize what I am. And it leads us to realize I am not mineral only. I have life in me in which I'm related to the plant kingdom. But I have more than that. I'm related to the animal kingdom. And I have something else beyond because I can reflect on what I know. And 
And that brings me to self-knowledge, and hence to Delphi. O human, know thou thyself. And this guy, Rudolf Steiner, says, this is the cosmic word. O human, know thou thyself, which has existed all of time of earthly condition and will exist throughout the earthly condition. <laughs> so what I tried to give last night from a cosmic perspective is what the computer is not so that we can understand what the human is. And it's there to challenge us, challenge us deeply, so that we become strong in spirit. We do not become strong in spirit if it's given to us. And what's been given to us is body, soul, and spirit. And we are spiritualizing those through what Steiner calls the fourth principle the ego, the I am, and it's working upon all of those. And when this earthly condition is done, we will have achieved a ninefold human being. We will have a threefold in body, a threefold in soul, and a threefold in spirit. We will be a reflection of the nine hierarchies. Now, of course, I didn't say all of that last night, but <laughs> you should have got it, right? <laughs> so, okay, let me turn that on, and then this will work. So, we did look at the path to Jupiter, which is the next planetary condition, for those who were not here last night, uh, not here, but at the talk last night, we looked at previous conditions and how even astrophysics today talks about three prior conditions that we had to have gone through in order to have heavy metals, such as uranium and lead. And these three prior conditions had human existence on it, but not human like us. We have to be really careful in words here because people are going to get the wrong idea. I'm talking about a stage, and you can hear Shakespeare here, if you know Shakespeare, about this being the stage. We are a stage today where we are the beings on stage, and the spiritual beings have created the stage for us, but we don't find them on the stage today. As in the past, people did experience the spiritual world directly and then more and more indirectly until finally it was experienced only as the manifestation of the divine. And until we got then into the 15th century, we started seeing it as just dead and calculable. So we looked at this word calculable universe and the incalculable universe in regards to a being that we call in anthroposophy and in Zoroastrianism, Araman, also known as the Prince of Darkness, as opposed to Lucifer. So we looked at the fact that evolution has peaked and we are now falling into devolution. And what does that mean? Well, it means that things are going to be withering and falling apart. Our bodies and the earth go hand in hand. There are a number of indications I gave from Steiner, but we'll look much more into those tonight. And then we looked at Araman's incarnation and we compared that as if you were a, an initiate back around 3500 BC and you knew that this glorious being who is the bearer of the light, who is going to bring us our <coughs> Gnostic wisdom, who is going to bring us the arts and culture, would also be the being that would lead us astray. 
How are we going to prepare for that? How are we as mere minor mortals going to meet this incredible being, Lucifer? And if you can imagine how awful that felt to the initiates at that time, how are we going to do this? And yet, we can be encouraged because they did succeed. And so now when we look at Araman's incarnation as the balance of the Lucifer incarnation, what we have to face for the rest of Earth time is facing this being of Araman and wresting from him the gifts that he brings us so that we can go on to Jupiter through the gifts of Araman. So this preparation for the future, we looked at that. We looked at Ray Kurzweil's singularity, that vision that many people like Ray have had that the artificial intelligence community shares, that the brain is, is where our consciousness is, but it's just a machine that we can reverse engineer. When we do that, we will be able to make machines far superior to this brain of ours that is fragile to all the biological aspects. And then we looked at <clears throat> prosthetic limbs and other sorts of ways in which human beings will be on this slippery slope of merging with machines. And for some, it was a very scary picture. For some, it was a very disturbing picture last night. And I think some of you went away saying, is Andrew saying Yahoo to this? Is he saying this is good? So tonight, I'll try to answer that question. And so we're on the second one. We're going to look at technology, and in particular to human sexuality. And no, I won't show any pornographic pictures. <laughs> and then um, what I'm trying to do now is we move from the cosmic meaning, the fixed stars in a sense, Tonight we'll be looking from the perspective of the planetary conditions, and then on the workshop tomorrow, we'll be looking at our modern time, the fifth, fifth post atlantean epic, or cultural age. And terminology, I stumbled all the time in my early years in anthroposophy. Translators sometimes use the word cultural age, sometimes they'll use the word epoch, Sometimes they'll use time or period. It's, it gets very confusing. And so throughout mine, I will call the post-Atlantean ages PACAs for post-Atlantean cultural age. So if you see the abbreviation PACA, I'm referring to post-Atlantean cultural ages. And I try to use the word epoch to mean the seven, and I'll, I'll have a slide coming up on this, um, the seven epochs of the human uh, destiny. So you can see what's coming up on Saturday, tomorrow. I don't know if we'll get through all of this, but it's going to be uh, a major attempt. And if you can't make all of it, it's fine. Come to what you can and duck out when you have to. It's perfectly all right. One thing is lunch is bring your own. Um, we'll have some goodies. If you want to bring something to share with everyone, feel free. And just to get a sense, so I know how many goodies to bring, raise your hand for a moment if you plan on coming tomorrow. And oh my, that's great. OK. Um, good, we'll have a, a good working group. I have prepared stuff for each one of these sessions that are not the Eurythmy ones, and Gabrielle back here has prepared the Eurythmy sessions, but I'm not going to take you through like lectures. I will have stuff to guide us, but I want it to be much more interactive tomorrow, and your questions will, you'll find just flowing out as we are going through this, and I will pose questions, so it's almost like a study group for this tomorrow. And I will have some answers to things, obviously, but um, most of it is just directed. And if we get through all of the slides, or just two, it's fine. We'll just go with 
the flow with what you need to have covered. And I mentioned this last night, but for those who weren't here, this is where you can find all of the lectures. They're up there for free as PDF files. As PowerPoint, I would put them up, but they're just too huge. And the other thing I've heard is if you put up source files, people might change something and then say, this is from Andrew Linnell, mm -hmm. and there's something in it that I didn't say. So PDFs are much harder to manipulate and that kind of stuff. So. <clears throat> The stars once spoke to men. It is world destiny that they are silent now. To be aware of the silence can become pain for earthly men. But in a deepening silence, there grows and ripens what men speaks to the stars. To be aware of the speaking can become strength for spirit men. Before I go on, any thoughts from yesterday that anybody wants to share from this verse? I'll share something. I, I get overwhelmed. I get tears in my eyes each time I work with this verse from where I am with this. These, these last three lines to me is really a synopsis of what the Western path is all about. And it's, it, to me, it's, it is so moving to feel this <clears throat> question that the stars are asking. And from what I said in the beginning about Delphi, they've asked that question. That's the cosmic word. And they're waiting what we answer, what we reply. Do you know the term Rosicrucian? I, I assume most of you do. They, this group existed in the 13th, 14th, 15th century and worked as initiates amongst us. They didn't wear any special garb. They didn't identify themselves as being any different. They lived amongst all the people. And nobody knew they were Rosicrucian. But some books came out, and these books created quite a stir. So many a person <coughs> sought them out, tried to become a Rosicrucian. And today, there are Rosicrucian groups, and one out in California began because a person came and listened to Rudolf Steiner talking about the Rosicrucians and he was so excited, he went back to California and started his own Rosicrucian group. I'm not saying that's bad or good, um, and maybe my voice sounded, but I think that what Steiner had in mind is so much deeper than anything you can find. And he tries to say that what they had to work with at that time was so materialistic and so much in the direction of materialism that it was very, very difficult for them to work at that time. <clears throat> but they were working with the concepts of alchemy. And he goes on to say that what we today as anthroposophists or spiritual scientists need, I just slide it over a little bit and then I, I won't be feeling like I'm dodging your eyesight, but um, is, is that what we bring has to be Rosicrucian. What does that mean? It means to me that we have to start from where science is today. We have to be where technology is today and we can be in the driver's seat to some extent and try to steer things to a healthy future. <clears throat> but there's only so much of that we can do. Don't, and, and we can't have a picture that says, oh, that's bad. I'm going to steer to what I think is the good. 
Because as soon as you do that, you jump right into Lucifer's domain or somebody else's. One of the themes that we brought up last night is, is that the sort of theme of God works in mysterious ways, that we are facing severe challenges in our time because we have to grow stronger in our spiritual work. We are working now on what's starting to call the consciousness soul. We've completed the development of the intellectual soul somewhat. And before that, the sentient soul. We became aware of our senses. We could connect our senses with concepts and throughout the intellectual soul. But now we're developing something much deeper. And that development happens inside the intellectual soul. So this importance that we must accept our epoch as it, as it actually is, but endeavor to influence it spiritually, says everything, I think, right now on, on this uh, slide. So, and back to this question, what are we? Well, the Bible tells us that we are soma, psyche, and pneuma, body, soul, and spirit. And so I made a diagram. Um, and there's an interesting correlation in Egyptian times if you see this bottom triangle as being moved up so that it fits here, you would have Egyptian time where when they looked out at the pyramids in the morning or in the evening with the gold leafing around those pyramids, that the sun would be reflected in such a way that they would see the pyramid from above descending to the physical. It was heaven and earth combined. Then we have the descent of this so that we now have a part of our soul that dives into the body. Steiner calls the brain one of the most physical parts of our body. And our thinking has gone through the etheric and now resides in the brain, which is why we have materialistic thinking prevailing today. But that thinking, he calls it dead thinking, because it's no longer connected to the etheric body. And he says, in our time, we need to develop living thinking. So we have the part that can of our soul that can reach into the spirit, and this is what we need to develop in balance to the part that reaches into the body. So the ages that we're in, the honest face that I showed last night, um, we are here in the fifth post-Atlantean cultural age. And we've been through earlier ages, epochs, four epochs, this is the fifth, and we have two more to go afterwards. And we also have two more post-Atlantic <coughs> cultural ages, and each one of these lasts roughly 2,160 years, where the time it takes the sun to go through one of the um, zodiac signs of the precession of the equinoxes. So if you do the math out, each of these would have had seven of those, and seven times 2,160, you know, and times seven, and you do math. <laughs> um, that's kind of how long the Earth and its physicality can last. We need some air movement. Mm -hmm. One of the I, I I'll just put this up for a moment. One can diagram each of those cultural epochs with the Indian right after the Atlantean time, being essentially the circle, the oneness of everything, pervaded Vedic philosophy. And we get to Persian times, we now have to draw it as an ellipse because there's essentially a duality that's arising in their philosophy. And this duality in Egyptian times begins to start separating but it still has this connection until we get to Egyptian times when it's in balance. And 
Snyder says this is the height, the peak of human physical evolution occurred during the Egyptian, I mean during the Greek time. Until we get to our modern times, where essentially spirit and physical have separated. And so we become monistic, either as a materialist or monistic in terms of spiritual or dualists, and saying these two never meet. We have no way of knowing how we get from consciousness to matter or from matter to consciousness. These Cassini ones, we won't go into those, but I thought it was interesting how you get plant forms and so on out of these math this mathematical equation. But, but I did want to show a diagram of our spiritual evolution, a sort of descent into Atlantean times. And this is a descent in that our interaction with the spiritual world is sliding away from us, so to speak. And at the same time, our physical evolution is continuing to rise so that in the Atlantean times, we, we have this kind of meeting of our spiritual evolution with our physical evolution. And then since that, we've been in a devolution period. Now, this is approximately where we are, so we should be on a spiritual ascent. Um, it's also interesting, back in Lemurian times, just before the ego enters into the constitution, we can't really call it a physical body, we don't have that till here, but into the constitution that we have an etheric body as its lowest body, we start having electricity enter. And we'll take that up at the workshop a lot more, but it's interesting, if we had no physical body, what does that tell us about electricity? Okay, and one last sort of uh, uh, slide to help us get into tonight. I have a history here of the development of computers, and I'm not actually going to go over all of this, but I want to jump down to 1959. When I joined IBM in 1973, it was entirely men, except for secretaries. Entirely men. I worked for, at the Investment New York Glendale Lab for 4,000 employees, and every single engineer and manager was a male. The way programming was done in its early years before Admiral Grace Hopper got involved was brute force. They would write code, load this, add this, store that. If it was this, go, they didn't have a go here. If it was this, they would say jump so many megabytes or bytes down. And if it wasn't that, jump somewhere else megabytes down in the code. And programmers back then were so proud of their ability to remember all of these jumps. And as they changed code, the distance you had to jump if you inserted something would change. And so software was failing all the time, all the time. And then a woman comes along. And if you remember our discussion about Lucifer and Aramon, and masculine and feminine, it took a woman to say, this is nonsense, guys. We can do better than that. And she developed machine-independent programming languages, which led to COBOL. It became the programming language for businesses from the 60s till we hit the year 2000, when everyone was afraid that all this old COBOL stuff was going to fall apart and break. And one other. Very interesting fact. We've had a number of Apollo missions. We don't have them anymore, do we? And the Russians sent three spacecraft to the moon, and we brought back rocks from these. They shouldn't. So homeopathically, within the Earth, we now have these rocks. 
but we've tested a lot of them. And we found something quite fascinating. It's completely confirmed today. Those rocks came from the Earth. They have the same isotopic signature that the Earth rocks have. So now they're busy coming up with theories that there used to be some planet, they gave it a name,